this story he provides for us now. And so I just ask, Lord, that you enter into this space. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into these walls. We open our hearts and our minds to you. That these 18 inches that separate the two and sometimes conflict because of our humanness, we ask you to align them. To allow our hearts and our minds to be fully captivated by you. So that everything we may do can be pointed and glorified to you. So Lord, we are so thankful we're here. Thankful that you brought us to this place. Thankful for the worship team and the way they lead us through music. Lord, we're especially grateful for Pastor Steve. As it is hard to come up here and preach week by week, but you have filled him. And you have filled him with a message. And so I pray that we have listening ears and listening hearts to hear that word today. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. All right, well, if you are a child or a children, I believe pre-K through fourth grade, but let me check my notes here. Yes, pre-K through fourth grade, you are can get up and go into the back with Miss Alicia. We will miss you, but don't worry, your parents will go and pick you up after service, so. All right. And if you, you are not in pre-K through grade four, you get to open your Bibles with me because we're jumping right into scripture today. We've got a good story. Um, it comes out of John chapter six. It's a long one, so you're going to have to stay with me. But I think there is a reference when we stand when the word of the Lord is spoken. So if you don't mind, if you are able um, if you would stand with me as we read through these scriptures. All right, I don't see as many people flipping through. I had, I cheated, I put a bookmarker there, so I knew, but I get it. A lot of you have your cell phones, I can't do that, it's a distraction. All right, here we go. John chapter 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside, and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? You see, he only asked this to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a year's wages to buy enough bread for everyone to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy, and he has five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks. He distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus knowing what they had intended to come and make him king by forth, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got in a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, 
they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You guys can be seated. All right, familiar passage of scripture this morning that we're, um, we're sharing, and it's good to see all of you here today. Um, so we're talking about just believe, and uh, actually that is the whole theme of the Gospel of John. We're making a shift, we've been in Mark, and now we're kind of making a shift over to, um, to John for a few weeks. Um, so if we go to the end of the Gospel of John, John tells us, uh, what his story of Jesus has been focused on, what it's been all about. So this is like the, almost the last chapter of, the, of John. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written, so this, I'm just going to tell you, this is why I wrote this book, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So the whole Gospel of John, if you're to sum it all up, it really does uh, reflect on that little phrase, just believe. Just believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Don't lose your faith. Just keep it strong. Keep it vibrant. Now, of course, faith, when it comes to believing in Christ, it, it it's not just a one-time believe. Hopefully, all of us here today can identify a time in our lives, maybe where we, we would say we came to faith in Christ. We opened our hearts to Him. And that's important. That's the beginning of our spiritual journey. That's the first time that we open our hearts to Him. And we begin this relationship with Christ. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to take that first step of opening your heart to Jesus, placing your faith in Him. Uh, he wants to be your personal Lord, your personal Savior. So that's the beginning place of believing. But for John and for Jesus, it's a lot more than that. It's like this everyday thing that we live out. It's got to be a part of every aspect of our lives. And what we did back there, if maybe it was Bible school or teen camp or a Sunday school teacher, or maybe your parents led you to Christ or a friend, but however you came to know Jesus as your Savior, that's the beginning. But then belief for John has to do with like every single, every single day, the way we live out of trust and faith in Jesus. So, can we just admit today, um, I guess I could say, can we be honest? Like sometimes we're not honest. It's like, um, you know, sometimes Christians say, well, to be honest with you, and I was like, well, I hope you're honest all the time. And it's not, I hope you're not just being honest now with me. <laughs> but, um, but to kind of be real, like these days, it's not all that easy to maintain this kind of vibrant faith in Jesus. Um, there's, I think it's because there's, there's so much bad news. There's so much negative stuff that's coming at us, like constantly, constantly being bombarded. You know, it's wildfires consuming um, acres out in the west, and you know, even we had the gray haze way here on the other side of the continent from those fires and, and flooding in Germany and China and the Delta variant. And it's kind of sad, you know, you look at the Olympics and the stands are all empty. It's just so, so different. And you know, all this stuff and, I don't know, crime in our neighborhoods, but then there's stuff going on in their individual lives. We all have our problems, don't we? We all have, have our struggles, um, financial stresses, like, it's been hard, like, to maintain mental health at this time. Anxiety and depression have been rampant. And uh, some of our members are battling with cancer. Some of the people that you love struggle with that. And so 
every day we face like these headlines in the news when it, it just kind of chips away at the vibrancy and power of our belief in Jesus. And, and sometimes it can leave us being, I don't know, a little bit discouraged, a little bit overwhelmed. Um, sometimes we kind of lose heart. But the Gospel of John, we're told, was written in this kind of bad news world to remind us that in Jesus Christ there's this wonderful good news that we, we, we come to and we, we celebrate and it was the, the whole message of the Gospel of John is to keep us focused on truly believing in him, keep our faith burning brightly and vibrantly and so the Gospel of John is kind of this faith booster just to keep it strong and alive in a bad news world. And we know that in Bible times it wasn't easy to follow Christ. I mean, even to say Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar is Lord, you could end up being burned at the stake, confessing Christ as your Savior. Um, it was a time when most people were poor. They paid 50% of their income taxes to the Roman Empire. I mean, it was a struggle, it was hard, it was a hard life that they lived back then. But Jesus came with this message of good news and hope, and that God forgives, that God brings new life, that, that uh, you can live and we can live as citizens of God's kingdom of love and mercy and forgiveness. And he healed people's bodies, and he, the miracles we've been talking about, he, he exercised authority over evil spirits, and... and uh, you know, he, he fed, today he feeds the hungry. It's such a, such a familiar scripture to us, isn't it? But it's all just a, a boost to our, our faith. So, um, as we went to the Gospel of Mark, we've seen how the crowds following Jesus have grown larger and larger and larger. And today, we're given a number. It's 5,000 people, 5,000 men. And so, you know, there's usually like a few women hanging out with the men, and there's kids, and I don't know, what, like maybe 10,000, 15,000 people. This is like a, a huge crowd. And so the crowds were swelling, and Jesus says to his disciples, let's go up on the mountain. And really, it seems like they were looking for a little break. We just want to, let's just get away from the crowds for a while. And um, we're told, actually, what the motivation of the crowd there in verse 2, it says a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. So it seems that Jesus had become something of a circus sideshow. You know, it's kind of like, step right up, see the wonder-working, miracle-performing Jesus of Nazareth, maybe he'll heal your body today or some of the body of someone that you love. They were there to see the show. It's interesting. We'll see this. We'll go through the sixth chapter of John. By the time you get to the end of the John chapter 6, you know how many followers there were of Jesus? Well, the disciples. That was it. The crowd had all gone. He was calling them to commitment. He was calling them to radical faith. And the more he began to issue that call, the crowds began to filter away because the show was over. Now is a call to radical faith and discipleship. So um, they, they went up on the mountain to, to, to pray, to be together there on the mountain. And, and um, well, it, there's kind of, that's kind of a code word there in the scripture that John uses, going up on the mountain. In the minds of the ancient people, the mountain was a place where God revealed himself. So we remember um, Moses. It's interesting. He mentions Passover time. And so it's Passover time, the season when they celebrate God releasing the children of Israel from uh, bondage and slavery. And so Moses went up on the mountain and he received the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. And got a cloud hovered over the mountain. And so the mountain was a place of revelation. I think of the prophet Elijah. He went up on the mountain and he was going to do, he was going to enter into a duel with the prophets of Baal. Remember that story? And, and he, he, there was the challenge, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And you remember, right? The, the, the prophets of Baal cried out, and they cut themselves, and they danced around, and nothing happened. 
And Elijah stood up on that mountain. And he just simply prayed a simple prayer. And whoosh, fire of God came. It was cool, it was powerful. So the mountain is a place where God works, a place of, re of revelation, a place of meeting in this presence of, of God. So they're up on the mountain. So there's a, a sense of expectation. And Jesus turns to Philip. And as Philip looks down the mountain, and they begin to see this, all the people are coming back. You know, it's 100 and 200 and 300 and 1,000 and 2,000, you know, 5,000. The big crowd is back. So Peter, Jesus wants to um, kind of test the disciples' level of faith. Give them a quiz. And maybe we could, it's good for us to kind of think, well, how's my faith level today? How, how well am I believing? And so he turns to Philip. How are we going to feed all these people? And Philip failed the test. Because Philip was a bean counter. You know what bean counter is, you know? Every organization needs a bean counter, and you got to kind of, okay, here's what the numbers say. So Philip was like a numbers guy, and so he's doing these computation in his head, and he figures out, okay, well, there's 5,000 men, there's maybe 5,000 women, maybe, I don't know, another 10,000 kids, like, like it's a buck a head to feed all these people, we will just kind of make it cheap, yeah, 20,000 bucks. We don't have that kind of money. There's no way we can feed them. No faith. Too big of a problem, too many people, not enough food, doesn't work, doesn't add up. And then I kind of imagine Andrew, he steps up and he's got his arm on the shoulder of a little boy. The thing about Andrew is he, he's always bringing people to Jesus. He's actually the one who brought his brother to Jesus. His brother was Simon Peter. He brought his brother and said, I want you to meet Jesus. I want you to hear the words that he speaks. And now he's bringing a little boy to Jesus. Billy Graham would say they have Operation Andrew, and as part of their, their planning, they, they, of course, the crusades aren't going happening anymore, but they used to say, bring somebody, bring somebody to Jesus, bring somebody to the crusade, they'll meet Jesus. You know, it's our job too, right? Bring people to the place where they can come to Jesus. Um, so Andrew had this element of faith. He, he had enough faith to bring a little boy with a lunch to, to Jesus, but, uh, but he still said, like, you know, what difference are five loaves of bread and two fish going to make? It's interesting, they're barley loaves, Scripture says. And barley was kind of like the poor man's grain. And so, you know, they're kind of not high-quality loaves of bread. And, you know, the, the, these weren't the kind of, this wasn't the fish that got away the two fish. Um, most Bible scholars think that, that kind of they have these little snack fish and they pick them, kind of like sardines. They didn't have refrigeration, so they had to wait to keep them fresh. So they'd pickle them. And that would be like a typical lunch. It's bread and a couple of little, couple of little fish. That's probably what they, what they had. And or at least had enough faith to say, to bring the little guy to Jesus, and then there's the boy, right? And you begin to, begin to think, well, who are you in this story? Where would you put yourself? Are you Philip? No faith? Are you Andrew? Eh, a little bit. And then there's the little boy, and it's an element of faith in the fact that he says, here you go, I don't have much. But as much as I have, Jesus, you, you can have. Just got a little. You know, maybe you can do something with it, so here it is. So the boy gives his lunch to Jesus. And then the rest of the story is all about what Jesus did for the most part. It's interesting that in the other Gospels, that this is one story that appears in all four Gospels. In the other Gospels, it's like Jesus divides them up into groups and, and the disciples distribute the food. But here it's just Jesus takes the bread and the fish and breaks it, blesses it, and he, he distributes it. That doesn't mean the disciples didn't help. Just John didn't mention that. Because I guess John wanted it to all be credited to the power of Jesus. So he has everybody sit down. It's springtime. There's plenty of soft green grass. Jesus takes the loaves, distributes it. They're, they're full. They're satisfied. Had enough. The disciples collect the leftovers. There was no McDonald's back then. There was no Taco Bell. 
So if you were like a traveling person like the disciples were, you had like a little basket that you, you kept with you everywhere. And, and so we think that probably when it says they collected 12, it was like their food baskets that each of the disciples had. And they got all filled up with the leftovers. So Jesus was kind of looking out for his disciples to make sure that they would have enough to eat the next day, the next day, the next day. That's what Jesus does. So then, everybody eats, they collect the leftovers, and then you see the response of the crowd. And they kind of are beginning to have some faith because Verse 14, they say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, they actually thought that the prophet would come before the Messiah. So that's kind of what they're talking about. We know that the prophet was John the Baptist. But they thought it was Jesus. That he would be the one to kind of get things ready for the Messiah to come, and they want to make him king. But that wasn't what Jesus had in mind. So what does Jesus do? Well, he heads up higher into the mountain. He just turns away from the crowd, climbs up higher. I need to get with God because I didn't come to become that kind of a king. So, who are you in the story? Who do you want to be? Kind of where Philip is, like kind of run low on faith this morning? You kind of identify with the man, it's been kind of hard. Too big of a crowd, not enough money. Okay. Kind of like Andrew, well, I'm trying to hang on, you know, and trying to bring my friends to Christ. You a little boy? Don't have much. Jesus, what I have, it shows. We used to sing a little song, and this, this passage reminded me of it. It said, Little is much when God is in it. How many of you have heard that song? The words are, does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it, for he'll not forsake his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. I've mentioned some, several times during this series of messages the quote by Mother Teresa, the, the to me is so powerful and so much a part of, of her life and ministry. Little things done with great love will change the world. Little things done with great love will change the world. Can you live with a belief in Jesus that looks beyond the circumstances of your life and this world and keeps trusting that the little things that you do make a difference? That your little prayers that you say faithfully for people you know who need Jesus, that God is hearing those prayers. And he is working. He is acting. Your faithfulness, your, your giving, your serving, makes a difference. You opening your home, this place of welcome and hospitality, I don't know, maybe you're lined up to teach third graders. And, and that's going to make God, that's going to make a difference. You're helping out your neighbor. You're sending a card. You're making a phone call. You're getting my kids to Bible school. Jesus can take your small efforts and faithful obedience and multiply them to make the kingdom impact beyond what you could ever ask or imagine. All right, we're going to go ahead and do this. Um, so we were outside, and we have your kids out there. Kids are all gone right now. Um, you look like you could stand up a minute. Just stand up. Take a little break. You just, I'll say hi to the people online. I don't know. I don't know if they can see us or not. But it's good to see all of you here today. <laughs> say hi to the camera. All right, we're going to go into the second part of this story. So you guys, you guys can be seated. So the first part is, do you believe? Do you believe? So then, the second part of the story, it's Jesus still up praying. He's on the mountain, he's praying. And he said to the disciples, you go on ahead. And he 
you, they probably think, well, he's going to like, he's going to just hike on the shore. So it's about eight miles across the Sea of Galilee. So that would have been a good hike around the shore. So they're going to go across the boat, and they think Jesus will probably meet them on the other side. This is the way they, they had it figured out. But as they're in the boat going across, the, the wind is blowing right into the face, their faces, the direction they want to go. So they're rowing hard. I don't know if you've ever rowed a canoe or rowed a boat. You know, it's pretty hard work. Your shoulders get tired pretty fast, and they've gone three or four miles in a, in a driving wind. Arms are pretty sore, and uh, there's no sign that the storm is, is going to let out, let up, and it's dark now. And they look out, and they see somebody walking in the water. How weird is that? <laughs> and they, they look, and the person is coming closer and closer, and then they hear a familiar voice. And that voice says what actually God says more, more than anything else in Scripture, the great, the most frequent command in Scripture, do not be afraid. Because they're really scared. <laughs> Something that God says more than any other thing in Scripture, he says, do not be afraid. And then he says, like, these words, it is I. It is I. And it's a tiny phrase the little phrase, it is I, is filled with all kinds of spiritual significance. The literal, literal translation of that is simply, I am. I am. The readers of John would have immediately recognized those words that Jesus spoke. It was really just one word. I am. They were steeped in the Old Testament again. It would have immediately taken them back. Maybe you can where those words come from, that word. They're immediately taken back. It's Passover time, so they've got this all on their mind. They're thinking about Moses in, anyway. And, and they're, they, they remember back the story about how God appeared to Moses in a bush that was burning but wasn't consumed. And God heard, or Moses heard, God say, go to Pharaoh and tell him to set my people free. And you remember Moses asked him a question. What's your name? <laughs> Who should I tell him to send me? And you remember what God says. God says, tell him, I am that I am. I am that I am. And that was a word, that was a name, Yahweh. Hebrew word Yahweh. And that name, we, we kind of translated Jehovah, that name became like the most holy name for God. It was so holy that they wouldn't speak it. They would put something else in place of Yahweh, some other name for God. Couldn't speak it. So what Jesus is saying as he approaches that boat is, it is I, he's saying, I am. He's identifying himself as God. I am God. I am here. Yahweh, don't be afraid. It was a clear statement of the divinity of Jesus, but what's even more remarkable about the Gospel of John is that that same little phrase is repeated again and again and again, but then it's kind of expanded upon. So in just a few verses, Jesus is going to say again, I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, this is the whole outline of the book of John. He's going to say, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, he's going to say, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection of life. Chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, I am the true body. It's I am, I am, I am, I am. Just Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. I'm writing this so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's clear here. Jesus is letting his disciples and us know he's God. He's got the situation under control. 
He gets in the boat, and then this is amazing. It's like, beam me up, Scotty. The boat is immediately transported halfway across the lake to the other shore. Believe in this Jesus, who has the power to take a little lunch and multiply it, turn it into food to feed thousands. Believe in this Jesus who walks on the water and tames the sea. Believe in this Jesus who is God come in the flesh, the great I am come to live right in us. Don't despair. Don't be discouraged. Don't be defeated by the bad news, the brokenness and sin of our world. Keep bringing people to Jesus. You might not have much, but give them all you have. Little is much when God is in it. He is the one who commands the wind and the waves. He is the great I am. So down to some of just believe, just believe, just believe. And I just close this morning by asking, do you believe? Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. God, there's a lot of stuff going on in our world today. It distracts us that disturbs us, and that worries us. That threatens to defeat us and discourage us. There may be stuff going on in our lives this morning. It just seem a little overwhelming. Situations that worry, we worry about. People we love. We're not sure how to respond to them. We prayed for them. But God, we just are reminded that You are God, that Jesus lives in us, that you take our small efforts, our sincere desire to follow you, and you multiply it and you make it enough. So Father, we pray that in these times that often pull us away, chip away, chips away at our faith. Renew our faith in you this morning. Increase our belief. You are the same God who fed the 5,000 men. You are the same God who walked on the water all the seas. You are the great I am. So Father, help us to live with that vibrant faith. It can't just be a Sunday thing. It's got to be an everyday thing. Lord, renew our faith today. Keep our eyes on Jesus, we pray. He's our hope. He's our confidence. May we live as faithful citizens of his kingdom of love and mercy and forgiveness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's join together in singing this song. Well, I've got to tell you this morning, I definitely believe. Thank you for a great message. So this song was not supposed to be, because I actually chose a different song. And we 
couldn't get a weekday practice, so I don't know, the song just came to me. We haven't done that in a while, but, and I just find it so appropriate. And um, like Pastor said, you just have to believe. Believe in all the miracles around us. Believe that today is even going to be better tomorrow. I want to open up the altar today to you guys. You know, maybe you got something in your life that's going on. You want prayer. Maybe you have a friend you need to pray for. Someone dear to you that you know need Jesus right don't be afraid to come forward. You know, God always said, do not fear. So this morning, just believe. You hold my every moment. You calm my raging sea.
September 19th, but don't come this evening because we won't be here. Um, just kind of wanted to update you on a few things that are going on. Um, this this Saturday uh, at 5:30, uh, there's a group of us that are going to go down to the Martinsburg Church of the Nazarene. Uh, there's a young couple that serves as the pastoral couple down there, uh, Joshua and Rebecca Woods. They have. Uh, probably not even 20 people that are part of the church, but they're trying to reach the community and they're having a movie night. And so we'd like to send a team down there to just kind of pass the flyers in people's doors and say, you know, hey, come to movie night and uh, welcome them. They're gonna give out popcorn, so they're gonna make popcorn and um, just kind of be on, be an encouragement there. So um, if you'd like to be a part of that team, let me know. And uh, we'll be leaving again at 5.30 on um, Saturday. Bible school's coming up August 9th through 12th. There's a few things we kind of need your help with related to Bible school. Uh, <clears throat> we need people to uh, help serve a meal to the workers each night. They tell me they have Monday and Tuesday covered. Still need workers for Thursday and Friday. And you can sign up at the welcome desk for, for that. Um, we have a good crew of uh, volunteers. Now we just need to make sure we get a good crew of kids. <laughs> so uh, what we did is, I don't know if you got one when you came in, but out at the, uh, where Carol greets everybody, there's like a flyer that we'd like you to take. And do you guys have any kids in your neighborhood? Um, do you have any grandkids around? Um, so anyway, this is for you to invite them to Bible school. We're, uh, we kind of bumped up the advertising on Facebook, but the most effective way to uh, get people to come to an event like this is a personal invitation. 
by far. I invite people. And um, so please do that. This is like one of those little things that we can do to make a big difference. At the end of Bible school, we have a church picnic planned at Dowers Wood that the afternoon of uh, the 15th. And we need to know who's coming. So there's also this sheet. And uh, we want to make sure there's enough chicken for you. Okay? So um, please, like, sign up by August 8th so we know how much chicken to get. Um, we have a men's conference that we just recently scheduled. It's a simulcast, um, and that's Saturday morning, August 21st at 9 o'clock, and we'll be telling you more about that in the weeks to come. We also just wanted to clarify that, um, I don't know, we kind of picked up that there's a little bit of confusion on our uh, church mass policy. We're, we're kind of aligned with the Maryland State, uh, Depart Maryland Department of Health, and um, they, they're not requiring, but recommending that those who are not vaccinated wear masks, and that's kind of where we are. We're not checking, um, but uh, so kind of that's where we are. It's like masks aren't required, but they are recommended uh, if you're not fully vaccinated. And then last thing, you'll be getting your newsletter in the mail soon if you haven't already, and uh, it's going to tell you that on Sunday, September 12th, that's a ways out. Uh, we've designated that as Fresh Start Sunday. And the plan, you know, plans are, who knows, you know, but the plan is for all of our Sunday school classes and small groups to kind of get in gear that Sunday and the, and the week following children, youth, adult Sunday school classes. So we figure everybody's done with getting away and it's time to start in fresh. And then also our Wednesday night family night activities will also start that week. And um, as part of this fresh start, we're also adjusting our Sunday morning schedule. So um, I'm not going to go over all the details right now. We'll be talking about that throughout the, throughout the month of August. But it'll be there in your newsletter. You'll see kind of the new, um, the new schedule. The, way, the reason we're doing this, I will tell you the reason, I won't go over all the times, but the reason we're doing this is we want to make sure that we don't, we, we, we allow families to all worship together, okay? And so what's, what's happened in the past is that um, we, sent our, we sent our teens and preteens to Sunday school and we came in to worship. And so we created a situation where teens weren't as engaged. In fact, they call this, this is adult church. And we don't like that. This should be everybody worshiping together. And so um, we're just kind of switching things up a little bit so we can be together and worship together as a family, as families. And you'll see that, and again, we'll be talking more about it in the days to come. So I think that's everything. If we can stand together, we'll have a closing prayer. And we will go out to do the work of Jesus in our, in our world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the Jesus who fed thousands from a little lunch to Jesus who walks on water to Jesus who knows our name but it's the great I am Jesus who is God who lives in our hearts and lives Lord help us those situations we're unsure of, the people we love that are struggling, we give those to you. And we pray that you would help us to live this life each day, even if it's just like a little bit of a mustard seed of faith. He said that was enough. To renew our faith, increase our trust in you, us to faithfully live as people of your kingdom of mercy and love and justice. We pray in Christ's name.